All right. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much. Well, friends, we are we're ready. And once again, thank you to Mr. Anderson for all of our uh, technical assistance. Close this, and there we go. All right. Um, remember, this is our last class before the Thanksgiving break. So next week we, we won't meet. You'll have the whole week to enjoy the spirit of Thanksgiving, which I think is just such a wonderful holiday. It's always been one of my very favorites. So I hope you have uh, just wonderful plans. Um, and, and it could be a good time for you to, to get ahead on some future assignments. Um, and so as you look, we'll have three more weeks in this semester following the Thanksgiving break, and then we'll finish up that American Military History Unit, which is the one that will start today. So let's start with the prayer, and uh, Kathleen, would you be willing to offer our opening prayer today? Thank you so much. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we could be here for this history class. Please help us to learn a lot and feel the Spirit during this class. And in Jesus' name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, well, friends, I have a question that I, that I thought might be helpful to, to start with today. When you hear the word war, what is the very first thought that comes to your mind? Gordon. The Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War. Okay, wonderful. And, and we, we have microphones that I think are just going to spread about. Um, anyone else? Thank you for that, Gordon. Go. Samuel and Mrs. Rickenbaugh. I think of people going boom, boom, boom with guns. Thank you for that. Certainly. <laughs> Part of it. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Rickenbaugh and then Isaac, was that a hand? Okay. And then Isaac and then uh, we'll have Emily. The first thought is hatred and then opposition. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think of wars in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I just think of like secret combinations, I guess. Yeah. Thank you for that. In fact, my family and I were in the war chapters right now in Alma and we we're talking all about, you know, when do you fight? When do you not fight? Please, uh, Emily. What was the question again? Uh, when you hear the word war, what is sort of the first thought that comes to your mind? Um, I think of um, patriotism. Uh, well, because I was thinking Revolutionary War. Sure, when, sure. When I heard it. So, um, like General George Washington. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. And we will definitely talk about him. And that will be next week. Or, well, not next week, but in our next class. We'll, we'll be in two Tuesdays. So, well, yeah. Um, I think of bloodshed. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, really, as, as you think about it, um, each unit brings out different questions, uh, different principles of the gospel. Certainly there's some that are, you know, a tie between all of them, and, you know, something that binds them together. But we're going to talk about something that may or may not be something that really excites you. Um, you, when I, and I was a boy, I, I thought war was really fascinating. I just, I would play it with my friends. I, I don't know, I don't know why. Just from, from a young, young age, I, I thought, you know, we would go, I said, okay, the question was, what war today? And they'd say, well, let's do World War II. And if so, we'd have a different game. We'd have, you know, the apple trees would be the, the bombers, you know what I mean? And I had this uh, beaver pond sort of down the hill, and, and that would be the site of our, our naval battles, you know. Um, but if the war was the Civil War, then, you know, we would dress up, and we had different clothes for that, and we would charge across the field. And I, I don't know exactly why we were so interested in this. Um, I think it has something to do with maybe the, the heroism that we associated with war, you know, and certainly there, there can be that. Um, but, you know, the older I have gotten, um, the more I just cringe thinking about this topic, not that there couldn't be a time and a place when it is the right thing and the righteous thing to do, but just even if it is, what a terrible way to solve a problem. I mean, we can't escape that. You know, this isn't a happy subject. Um, it could be a righteous subject if we're talking about a war fought for the right reasons, a war that would be sanctioned by the Lord. Um, but even still, we're talking about brothers and sons and grandfathers and uncles and, and others um, who end up dying, even for a good cause, uh, which can be very heroic, but can certainly also lead to a temporary separation that is very hard to deal with. And I think as, as we think of the gravity uh, of this topic, you know, uh, this is... 
a place where I would play as a, as a boy. Um, and, and this is one of those areas where, you know, I would pretend I would, you know, go down behind. This was a place where I, I would love to pretend I was in the Revolutionary War and I'd hide behind the stone walls and I had my little wooden gun that I had whittled, you know, and I would pop up and I would shoot and I'd have to go and I'd be trying to, you know, the ramrod, which was usually some like dandelion or something, <laughs> push it in, you know. Anyway, I'd go through the motions and then my brother would be on the other side, you know, that kind of thing. And we would just do this and, and then, you know, at the end we'd shake hands and, you know, we'd try to arm wrestle to see who'd won. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then we'd move on, you know, but it's an interesting thing to imagine these New England woods filled with Wampanoag warriors um, attacking towns, uh, filled with, once again, brothers and uncles and grandfathers and sons who are out when they should be taking care of the cows and, you know, other chores around the home, uh, raising their children, sitting in on some lessons given by the mother in spelling or whatever it may have been, sitting together, reading the Bible, but yet here they are out in the woods shooting at people. I mean, this this is, you know, this is a, a hard thing to think about. Um, you know, as, as we think about here, once again, just another place in Massachusetts affected uh, by the war that we'll talk about today, which is one that many people don't talk too much about. But um, were you surprised by that statistic at the beginning of the reading? Yeah, one in 16. Do we have 16 people here today? I, I imagine we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, I'll be the one so that way you don't have to be. But can you imagine? I mean, just one of us walking out the door, not coming back until we have a happy reunion in the spirit world. But once again, kind of a sobering thing to think about. One of us never walking through that door again in this life with a body. Right? Perhaps as a spirit, you know, we play, make a visit because, you know, the spirit world is right here. Brigham Young taught, but still there's that separation, you know. Um, well, with all that said then, um, come with me just for a moment to King Philip's War, also known as Metacom's War, um, and I'd like to ask you a question. And, this, and we may come to this question sort of in every uh, topic that we have for this unit. Do you, don't answer yet. Would you reason that this was a quote-unquote good war if there could be such a thing? Was this a righteous war? Was it right to fight? What do you think about the causes behind the war? Do you think the Lord was pleased with it? Think about that, and then we'll, we'll come back uh, with a little bit of background. King Philip's War, also known as Metacom's War, was the longest and deadliest conflict between Anglo, meaning English, and Native Americans in the 17th century. The war which raged in southern New England, mostly in Massachusetts, in 1675 and 1676, accounted for the deaths of at least a thousand colonists and approximately 3,000 Indians, mostly Wampanoag. Here uh, is a very old, 1772, uh, picture, uh, uh, well not a picture, but, but an artist rendition of uh, King Philip, also known as Medicum. Uh, well, he, he, he's one of the sons of Massasoit, uh, who we know from interactions with the pilgrims. Uh, we'll see that his brother Wamsada will also be involved. He'll die before the fighting starts. Uh, Massasoit uh, had a headquarters at Mount Hope. We'll talk about that. That's where he'll, he'll be betrayed and killed at the end, as, as you may have remembered reading. But uh, think about this man, once again, a child of God, trying to live in this difficult world that he was in. Uh, and tell me what you think about the start of this war. Because one sixteenth of the male colonists of military age were killed which makes the war the deadliest in American history. And who talks about it? Everybody talks about the Civil War. Oh, wasn't World War II terrible? Was, of course, they both were. But which makes the war the deadliest in American history in terms of the proportion of deaths to the fighting population. Of the people actually available to heft a gun, more people died in this war than in any other we've ever had. The popularization of the flintlock musket accounted for the high casualty rate. Though some colonists still preferred the familiar but cumbersome and inaccurate matchlock musket, which had to be steadied on a pole and ignited with a match, many had switched to the flintlock musket, which could be held in one's arms and fired without a match. Along with traditional bows and arrows, Indians relied heavily on the flintlocks and even built a large forge for creating and repairing their own. So this is, at least by 17th century standards, a very sophisticated war. 
And that's why we have a lot of death. Anytime you have more modern technology going up against more less than modern strategy, you have very high casualties. It would be the same thing in the Civil War. We'll talk about that with the rifled musket, etc. Okay. Um, anyway, nevertheless, the colonists' sheer numbers and amount of firepower overwhelmed the natives, and the war, which had been caused by unyielding English encroachments on Indian lands and by colonial government's impositions of English law on Indians, left the Wampanoag without the leaders, population, or resources to continue effective resistance in the future. So here's the question then. We stare at this flintlock musket, uh, just kind of the pieces, just to have you kind of imagine being there. What do you think? What would you reason? Does this seem like a good war, a righteous war? Yes, no, somewhere in between? Tell me why. Please, Rachel. Well, um, in this war, they were fighting because the Indians wanted their rights back. The English were imposing on them, and the Indians wanted their rights back, although it was fulfilling prophecy in mm -hmm. um, First Nephi, but still, it wasn't really, like, the Revolutionary War was fought for freedom, but this war was fought because the English were not treating the Indians right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Please, Gordon. Well, um, <clears throat> kind of like what Rachel said, they were trying to get their rights back, but also the English people were protecting their homes and families. Mm -hmm. So. This is where it becomes tricky, right? It's, yeah, it's not like an invading force of Englishmen came in and started killing Indians like crazy, but mm -hmm. they came out and protect, protected their homes. Okay, thank you for that, right? And, and this is where you see those who are making decisions to fight a war have a different responsibility before the Lord than those who simply go along with the decisions that have been made by those who are in authority. Right? And then that's like a really interesting question to be in because, for example, right, when you have a governor of a colony saying, okay, now we're calling upon all able-bodied men to fight, right? you then have a choice. right? Do you go along with this governmental authority asking you to fight right? or do you sit it out for other reasons? But yet, even if you try to sit it out, what do you do when the Indians come and start burning your town and your house is next? Do you stand out with your gun and try to do something? Or do you say, well, I don't know if I really agree with this. And we may have abused their rights, so I'll just sit here as, as my own house burns down. You know, this is a tricky, tricky thing. Um, well, by the way, let me just point you to this. We'll come to this um, in uh, what be our, our, our last week, so in, in kind of four classes, including this one. There's three more after this one. Um, but 1942, the first presidency gave a really, really interesting and thorough um, just explanation, a, a doctrinal explanation about war, uh, and essentially said, like, this is just a little sneak peek, um, but, you know, those who make the decisions to go to war are really held to a different standard than those who are simply being good citizens and following what they've been asked to do by leaders, you know. Uh, if you die fighting a bad war as a loyal citizen, that sin isn't on your head, right? That's on the head of those who made, those who have made that decision to be in the war in the first place. Uh, and so that's an interesting, that's an interesting, we really have some times where we have some great decisions to make. Um, okay, anyway, we keep that in mind. I want to share three quotes now by President Hinckley, because he said a lot about this, uh, about this topic. In fact, I remember being, I was sitting in Heritage Halls, I was sitting, and it was, in fact, it was uh, Emmeline B. Wells Hall, which is where I was uh, going uh, to, well, I was at BYU, and that's where I lived. I lived at my very first semester. Um, and uh, as I was there, we had this little tiny television. You know, it, was not, it wasn't a flat screen. It had, it had the big back and all, and all that, you know, the rabbit ears. Um, and we were watching um, President Hinckley speak about this topic, and I, and I remember feeling some really powerful things that I think we'll, we'll talk about over the course of this lesson as well as others uh, here. Uh, here's uh, one thing that President Hinckley said 
um, in 2001? Because why, why do you think President Hinckley was talking um, in the October 2001 General Conference about the subject of war? Can anybody remember back then? 9-11, <laughs> right? Certainly, you know. How, how old were you in 2001, Samuel? Oh, you, you were tiny. So, do you remember 9-11 at all? No. I mean, you, you, any hubbub in your house? A little bit? How old were you? I was two, but I remember watching it. Okay, but you saw something. You have a memory of it. Okay. Okay. Um, and do we know? Do, do we need to clarify? You were in the womb. Oh, well, good. You were, oh, that is sweet. You were four months old. That is so cute. Uh, well, friends, um, the, the, the terrible terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers in New York City, the White House, other locations, you know, et cetera. Um, we could talk about those. Um, but he's going to address something that I think is very interesting. Once again, this idea of, you know, when is it right? When is it right to fight a war? Because certainly, right, you think about um, Section 98 of the Doctrine and Covenants, 9816. Right, renounce war and proclaim peace. I mean, that, that's the rule. That's what we try to do, you know. Um, but sometimes we're not able to do that. So when is it right to fight? Well, we are people of peace. We are followers of the Christ who was and is the Prince of Peace. But there are times when we must stand up for right and decency, for freedom and civilization, just as Moroni rallied his people in his day to the defense of their wives, their children, and the cause of liberty. On the Larry King television broadcast the other night, I was asked what I think of those who, in the name of their religion, carry out such infamous activities. Uh, and, and this is also sadly appropriate, coming off of what has just taken place in France, as you think about justifications by the Islamic State for attacks there um, recently. Anyway, I replied, religion offers no shield for wickedness, for evil, for those kinds of things. The God in whom I believe does not foster this kind of action. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of love. He is a God of peace and reassurance. And I look to him in times such as this as a comfort and a source of strength. So, what do you think? Does this shed any light on King Philip's war? Good, bad, ugly, somewhere in between? Uh, I think uh, Isaac has one, and then maybe over, yes, thank you. I think I definitely agree with what he's saying, and I think that in times where being an aggressor, there is no excuse mm -hmm. for that. Um, mm -hmm. But like when people are called upon to defend their country, that's different, obviously. Um, with this in particular, I think that it was a righteous war on behalf of the English and the fact that they were defending their homes, even though rights may have been violated <laughs> of the Indians. Although I don't agree with um, their attacking a fort of neutral of a neutral party, <laughs> which I don't agree with that one act. But overall, I think it was a righteous war. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Gordon, please. Well, it's not like um, with the Crusades where they would go and kill the Jews. Mm -hmm. and it was a religious act, I guess. Mm -hmm. The Catholics would. But here the Christians were just defending themselves. It's not like they had a call from their religion to go and mm -hmm. slaughter all the Jews. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Let, let's flip this just for a moment. What do you think about the Wampanoag Indians and others choosing to fight? Isaac. Well, a lot of the Native Americans, um, they're very, um, I don't know, they're very passionate about what they, about like, their land and, well, just not as much the land, but just like, they're very, I don't know. I, I, it just seems well coming from the Lamanites. They're very like they're a war fighting people, and when um, other tribes um, trespass into their tribes, they're very um, 
to protect it. Yeah, that, there's the word protected. And I think that when I think they took it really great when the Anglos first showed up, like most of them were really nice and stuff. And I think that they just sort of ran out of patience in some ways, and um, it was just a situation that wasn't taken in the right way. Thank you, thank you, Isaac. Thank you. What else, please? Um, I think that they could have found a way to solve it without mm -hmm. fighting. Mm -hmm. um, also, they they weren't completely in the right either because mm -hmm. they were allowing themselves to be cheated, basically. Like, mm -hmm. when it talks about how they'd get drunk mm -hmm. and how they do other things that mm -hmm. made it so they could get cheated on by mm -hmm. the English. I feel like if they would have taken more responsibility mm -hmm. and not, like, tried to blame the mm -hmm. English for the problem, then they could have solved it and without fighting. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Caleb. There's a lot of people who make up a culture, and not all of them are nice, necessarily. And so, like with what Sam's saying, just because a couple of those people are taking advantage of other people or taking away their rights doesn't mean that you have to go to war. Mm -hmm. There's always another solution. And it seemed like they, like you said, just ran out of patience mm -hmm. and weren't really so work for peace rather than just looking for an excuse to fight over yeah. Thank you for that. Because here's the thing, right? Certainly, Massasoit's son, Wamsada, was killed somehow. We don't know how. To this day, we're not sure, right? He went to meet with the English. He didn't come back. Um, certainly, the suspicion of the Indians was they had, the English had killed him, right? And so how do you feel about that? If one of your leaders, like let, let's say that a United States president, let's just imagine any president, President X, so that way you're not thinking somebody you love or somebody you hate or, or whatever. Um, president X goes to a certain country. He doesn't come back. We hear that he's been killed. We're not sure. Is that cause, is that, is that just cause to go to war with that nation? Yes, no, maybe, not sure, and why? Gordon? Well, war is drastic measures. Like, mm -hmm. it's to solve huge problems. I think if they went over there with an ambassador and they <clears throat> tried to work it out mm -hmm. with that other nation, then they might find out this. Like, in this case, well, we don't know, but if it wasn't the English, then they would have found out. Mm -hmm. They could have figured out somebody mm -hmm. else. Right. Thank you for that. Um, Camilla and then Brenna. It's kind of like the, uh, um, the law that you have to be proven guilty without any doubt mm -hmm. before you can be condemned. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you have to be able to prove without a doubt that there's a reason to go to war. Yes, very important. Thank you so much. But not just assume the worst and send millions of people to their deaths on, on, a, on an assumption. Thank you for that. Please, Brenna. I think it could be justified if they absolutely knew mm -hmm. that they had, that they had killed him. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, this kind of reminds me of that story in the Book of Mormon where, uh, you know, the priest. Uh, kidnap all the Lamanite daughters right. and then they go to war against the Nephites because yeah. they think it's son and they're like, why did you do that? And you know they said we would have we would have helped you find them and stuff. Yeah, oh that's a great great connection. Thank you so much, Greta. Please, Caleb. I think too. Why would you make a whole nation suffer mm. because of one thing that could be worked out another way? Yes. Certainly. And then, then you even had this interesting, even if you want to live by this lesser law of an eye for an eye, John Sassaman was murdered. And most people think that it's a safer assumption, maybe not unto, um, there's enough proof that he was murdered by King Philip's men uh, because he was an informant for the English telling them that King Philip was planning on attacking the English. And so if we're going for just the one for one, you know, that's done, but yet 
even think about what the informant was going to say, that they're planning to attack. And so that plan was sort of in the works even before that life was traded for a life, if you want to look at it that way. So, yeah, Gordon, and then Isaac. I know I'm making way too many comments. No, no, I appreciate um, your comments. There's a scripture that says, in the worth of a soul in God's eye is equal, so we're all equal. Would you, like, if you were a government official deciding wars, would just because one of our senators died, are they worth more than millions of citizens? Right. Thank you for that. It's a really great point. I love that. <laughs> Isaac? Um, I think it's sort of the natural, natural man in us. <laughs> they kind of started this war because, um, I don't know, if someone came in, if my brother went to some kid's house and didn't and just disappeared and uh, someone's house I was suspicious of, <laughs> I mean, I would... I wouldn't be okay with that. Like I would, um, I mean, it'd take a lot of um, gut to not go out and look for my brother and try and yeah. Um, I figured that out. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. These are wonderful relations. Please. Just and get a, a microphone. There you go. Thank you so much. I often remember in the, in the Book of Mormon, the Lord tells them not to be the aggressor until mm -hmm. they would be protected. They would stay in their own lands. Right. But. Uh, we don't very often do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we will talk about that, especially this idea of Wilsonianism um, and American intervention all around the world for all these different reasons. That will become very important to talk about. Thank you for that. Um, please, Mrs. Rickenball. It's straight. Uh, there we go. The subject just can really strike at the core yeah. because I, I'm thinking about, like I watched a video of an um, Islamic <laughs> man today talking about how he feels like it's their responsibility as as a religious person to convert Americans and convert French and, and we kind of thought the scenario through. So what if they came into our country like the English came into sure. their country did you and you know imposed ourselves or imposed themselves upon us and asked them us to take upon their religion and their laws and all these different things. And so it's really hard because in so many senses, I think these Indians have the right because they've been, their rights have been taken away in a lot of ways. They were driven out and killed and all that kind of stuff. And so it's just a really sensitive subject yeah. because we know from scripture that mm -hmm. this was going to happen. Right. It was prophecy and whatever, but it's tricky because I think we feel like we have more rights than they do mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Sure. And that were justified in all of our actions right. and the wrongs that we did to them because we are superior to them. Thank you for that. It's a great, great comment. You know, and that's the thing. I love this conversation because I think as you can see, there's not just a terribly easy answer. It's not terribly easy to say you know, everything the English did was great or everything the English did was terrible. And same thing, everything the Indians did was great, justified, and heroic, or everything they did was terrible. There's just this mix. Um, and I think that's something that We'll see here. Next, there's a. Let's do this one by. Oh, by the way, just to kind of show you, this is the area engulfed um, by the fighting, uh, and so as you can see, most of southern England, uh, New Hampshire, uh, wasn't as involved because it's a uh, little dotted line there. But you'll see all these areas here: Massachusetts, and then Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, certainly involved. There's a quote by President Hinckley that I'd like to. This one here. This one I think is really interesting. He gave this one. Um, in 2003, I'm sure you can see it. Um, we sometimes are prone to glorify the great empires of the past, such as the Ottoman Empire, the Roman and Byzantine Empires, and in more recent times, the vast British Empire. But there is a darker side to every one of them. There is a grim and tragic overlay of brutal conquest, of subjugation of repression and an astronomical cost in life and treasure. The great English essayist Thomas Carlyle once ironically shared the observation, quote, God must needs laugh outright, could such a thing be, to see his wondrous mannequins here below, close quote. I think our Father in heaven must have wept as he has looked down 
upon his children through the centuries as they have squandered their divine birthright in ruthlessly destroying one another. Um, friends, as, as you think about this, this quote, um, once again, whether natives or, or Anglos are right, wrong, or indifferent in different areas of this conflict, um, I think there's something here that needs to be understood that's kind of an underlying principle. When you think about war, tell me what principles are being violated, even if you have a really great reason to go to war. Do you see anything here that President Hinckley is saying? Just we need to understand this when it comes to fighting. Sometimes we just see, you know, the wonderful accomplishments of some of these empires and then say, um, you know, wait, there, there's, there's more. He's trying to help us understand that there's more to everyone. Caleb and then Mrs. Richter Um There was a really old movie made in the 80s, I believe, maybe the 90s. Um, it was about the Cold War and about nuclear weapons. And basically, the culmination of the movie was the only winning move is not to play because there's no good outcome from the nuclear war. I think in a way that applies to all war because, yeah, you can win a war or you might even be doing it for a good cause, but in the end, there are losers on both sides because someone is left without their husband or their brother or their son, and in some cases, their mom or sister and so forth. But there really is no winner in war because there's always a cost and it's never one that is feasibly worth it, per se. So. Thank you for that. A very profound statement. Mrs. Rikova, please. Um, we have been given these divine rights to life mm -hmm. and given by God and pride is always the central mm -hmm. um, theme of war. Mm -hmm. And, and it's typically for gain. Um, and to take away a ma another man's life or a whole community or a colony or a country, in the case of you know, uh, major warfare, is just absolutely horrific and horrible. And, and you know, I think about um, Satan and his his great plan to use war as a strategy mm -hmm. in opposition to what God wanted right. for us. And it just, it breaks my heart to think about how how often and how prideful and how hatred and this anger takes away this divine right that we've been given from God. Thank you. Thank you for so life. Yeah. Thank you for that. Please. Not to make this political in any way, but I read an article that was referring to Ron Paul's book mm -hmm. about the immorality of war. Mm -hmm. And he talked about when he was when he was a little boy in America, uh, it was World War II, and, and he said we were praying here for the American soldiers to win in Germany, but he thought, but my relatives are there, mm. and they're all being killed. Am I not supposed to pray for them too? Right. And even as a child, he could start to see there's two sides to this. Mm. And, and even in World War II, I think Abraham Lincoln, or in the Civil War, Abraham yeah. Lincoln made something like, I think the Southern, families pray harder for their boys than our northern families pray for theirs. And it's just most war is immoral, I think, is the bottom line. Sure. Oh, thank you for that. And these are such important um, concepts. Let me just share a story, you know, thinking about this. Um, when you think about the toll that a war can take, and you start talking about, you know, 620,000 lives, really, that number is only as important as you can understand the number one, if that number were someone that you absolutely loved and grew up with. Um, the reason why I share that is because um, war can do more than just, as you know, kill people. I have a brother who's in the United States Marines, uh, Marine Corps, um, and he is 10 years younger than me. Um, I have a, a wonderful, wonderful father. Um, who is just, I mean, he, he has been a best friend. Basically, until I got married, he was my best friend. Um, but he didn't really like sports at all. I mean, never played a single sport, didn't know anything about them, and, and just didn't really have 
the interest. You know, he tried a little bit to coach, you know, here and there, little league teams. But anyway, um, I have always enjoyed sports, and my brother really enjoyed sports too. Um, and so all through his growing up years, ever since he was this tiny little, I mean, I remember him. He was born. He he couldn't he couldn't drink milk, and he was a poor child. He was always sick, you know. And there's this little peanut. Um, and uh, he was so, so tiny growing up anyway, but he loved sports and uh, I would take him outside. We'd play basketball and we'd play baseball and we'd play soccer and we'd play football, everything we could think of, frisbee, I mean, you name golf, um, anything we could think of, you know, we'd play and, and we played for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I coached his teams growing up as soon as he got to the, sort of the competitive age, you know, but from the time he was, I think, eight and up. I was coaching his soccer and his baseball teams. I'd come home um, from BYU in the summers after I, my mission, and I'd gone to BYU, and I'd come home, and I would coach his Babe Ruth-level baseball team, which is kind of the, the 13 to 16-year-old team in New Hampshire. You know, and I, I coached uh, his middle school soccer teams. And you know, Anyway, I had this really, really close bond with him, um, and we would just spend all this time talking, and he was the most just sensitive sensitive young man. Well, it's been interesting um, because as he's been in the Marine Corps, um, as much as there has been so much good that, that he has done and so much that uh, that he has seen as, as very noble and he has great intentions, uh, whether or not you know he should be sent to the places that he's been sent to, that's kind of another, that's not his decision, you know, but, but on his side of things, I think he has wonderful reasons to, to want to do what he does, um, you know, but I have just seen in him, there's just been this hardening um, and our relationship is so different than it ever was. Um, this young man who had been so sensitive, um, who we had done so much together now, um, we can't laugh about the things we used to laugh about. Uh, you know, when we go to play sports now, it's, oh, you know, I'm too tired, I'm hurt. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm too serious now. You know, I don't do that anymore. You know, I, I have bigger things to worry about. And I've just seen that for him, um, there has been a toll on his emotional well-being, um, and it's been really kind of scary. I could go into more details, but I'll spare you some, but just this idea of a post-traumatic stress um, situation for him, you know, um, that too is really hard. And so can I just say, just kind of as, all, as we're all talking here, I would imagine that we all know someone who, right, we're so grateful for their service. This is by no means to put down those who serve. Uh, faithfully, heroically, for wonderful reasons. Um, I am so grateful for the sacrifices of the men and women who, who have come before uh, to to help our nation um, as these loyal citizens willing to give even their very lives, you know, for things that they hold so dear. Um, but there's also such um, a tragic overlay, um, as President Hinckley mentioned, um, even to those who are still with us. There could be. Uh, and so just as we talk about this, um, this unit and all the different wars, because it's one war after another, um, I would just ask you to really be prayerful um, about this topic uh, and really serious to ask the Lord what he'd have you learn um, about the realities um, as well as all the truths um, behind the Lord's doctrines of war uh, when it's right, when it's not right, even if it is right, what do we lose, what do we gain, you know, et cetera. Uh, so with that said, could we just come for a moment to that source? Uh, would you go, and I'd like to just look at uh, the question about the different abuses against uh, natives, because uh, I think we mentioned a couple other things, but, but let's just talk for a moment, um, because certainly, whether it was right or not, um, you know, for King Philip to lead uh, this attack against the colonists, and then of course the colonists fight back, and we have this terribly bloody war over a couple of years, whether uh, that was right or not, could we just for a moment take a look and try to put ourselves um, <coughs> in the natives' moccasins, so to speak, uh, instead of their shoes, uh, to, to, to try to really wrap our minds around what would it have been like to have become a weak minority, fast minority, because you'll see these different diseases will decimate populations, um, sort of 75% as a whole, if you look at North America, uh, just decimated by disease. This is not even, the shot was fired. Um, right, some tribes, 98%. Uh, um, this is just disease because immune systems weren't used to um, European germs, you know. And, and once again, no, nobody. This isn't biological warfare. 
Nobody's intending for this to happen, but when you get people together and they share germs and you're not used to them and you haven't built up an immune system to them, um, bad things can happen. So you may want to go home and lick some, some dirt you know, to build up your immune system. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, figuratively speaking, I mean, sometimes dirt and, and germs can be an okay thing in, in, the, in the right proportion um, to build up that system. Anyway, but with that said, let's just take a look for a moment. What do you see if you were to reason? What are some of the grievances um, that were mentioned from sort of the Indian perspective? What do you see happening that really could have been tough? Whether or not it warranted war, what could have been tough? Please, Caitlin. Um, I think one of the things that would be really hard for them is their land. <laughs> they felt that they were so violated <laughs> in that. Sure. That was something that was basically their religion, was they worship the land and <laughs> the different spirits and the land and everything. And that was, they felt cheated and they felt like they were trying to share with the English and be kind that way, but the English took advantage of them. <laughs> um, so I think that would definitely be something that would be difficult. And the fact that the English cattle were, you know, not even staying in the land that they sure. gave them or felt that they were just taken from them, but they were still coming to their things. So I think that would have been hard for them. Yes. Thank you for that. Mrs. Rickenbach, was that a head? Please. I don't, well, I felt like they were very manipulated, too. Um, just in, with the whole disease thing, with religion, with... A lot of these different things, I felt like they, there was a lot of manipulation that was used. Thank you. Thank you for that. Please. Um, for in the court system, um, it said like 20 of their honest Indians mm -hmm. would testify that an Englishman had done something wrong, but it wouldn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And then, and that was so different for them because they said that. Even like if one of the most dishonest people of the tribe testified of something, they that the everyone believed them. Mm -hmm. So their opinions weren't being um, recognized. Yeah, thank you for that. And this is brings up this great debate in the Constitutional Convention. If you go to that summer of 1787, you have James Madison making this very famous comment um, because, of course, what kind of representation did he want? Anybody remember? Proportional, right? Proportional, just by persons. That, you know, shouldn't each person count the same? You know, right? Does, does it take 25 Rhode Islanders to equal one Virginian? Simply because Virginia is a bigger state? I mean, you know, like, are they, are they are they better? You know, it's an interesting thing to think about uh, when it comes to not doing a representation by proportion. Um, but this idea of, I mean, how many natives did it take to equal one white testimony? Did you need 25? 30? 35? I mean, what, what does that say about the way we view each other? Um, and certainly, as President Hinckley is talking here, notice, we each have a divine birthright, right? Every one of us is a beloved child of heavenly parents, right? And as such, each one of us, everyone, no matter what they look like, where they've come from, uh, or what they're doing in their life right now, good or bad, each has a divine nature and destiny. doesn't mean we'll all get to the same place. Uh, all choices aren't equally good. But certainly, we have an equality in having a divine nature and destiny as a birthright from heavenly parents. Linda. Um, well, I feel like they were very manipulated too because they, the English would get them drunk and then they would make these bargains that was over that they say, oh, it's only worth this much. But then later on, if they were guilty, the Indians would be like, oh, it's actually supposed to be worth over double that. Thank you for that. That you're bringing up, and just because they didn't hear that great comment in the microphone, this idea of some were manipulated through alcohol, and you know they were more land was taken when they weren't able to fully understand what was going on, etc. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so so here's here's the question. That we certainly, oh, did you have a hand? Oh no, sorry. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Okay, because I'm sure it would have been great if you had one, um, guys. As you think about this source, then, but certainly, once again, just kind of a, a troubling, troubling source, and, and a lot of these sources will be troubling. Uh, we, we have got, so we've got some neat uh, poems, actually, for our, our World War One uh, uh, little topic that we have that are written by soldiers that I, I really like. They're actually I find them very inspirational. Um, but I think some of right this topic really will be this idea of of what not to do, right? So here's my question to kind of give us sort of a positive 
Okay, when have you seen in your family people treating each other well, justly, even if necessarily they could have taken advantage of others? For example, in my home, we have lots of little ones. Um, and there are many times where the older ones say, you know, I will give you three pennies if you give me just one dollar. Three for one. Isn't that a good deal? And we have to be, well, let's, let's talk together, children, about the value. You know, and uh, even, don't be deceived by the three to one. You know? and, and then they're like, oh, okay. Um, so have you ever seen, though, um, in your home, this opportunity to really do well to each other, to treat each other well. Um, when has that happened? Because certainly, we, you know, we, we don't want to ask, you know, when, when has someone manipulated someone else, you know, in your home? It's not necessarily an inspiring conversation. So on the other side, right, when have you really seen kind of that nobility of spirit? Because we all have the natural man, right? but we also all have, right, a divine birthright. And at any given time, we can either choose to be more like the one or more like the other, right? Um, so when have you seen... People treat each other really well. We just kind of relate this. Because I'm sure it happens a lot. Linda, and let's give dear Linda a microphone. Thank you so much. Every year after Halloween, we always treat our candy. And sometimes um, the boys will just like say we can. If you'll give us a big chocolate bar, then we'll give you two. Two or three Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> and so she'll usually make it, but Mary, she always, it's like, she always gives Mackenzie way more oh. to get one teeny little candy that's her favorite. Oh, that is very sweet. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. What else have you seen? Something heartwarming in, in happy relation between people versus the tearing each other down and then shooting them, as we've been talking about today. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the other side. Where God would like us to spend our time. I'll share. I'll share one. Um, speaking of Halloween, it inspired me. And my my children went around our little neighborhood, you know, and um, they came back. And the very first thing they did uh, for my wife and I, they all went around. We didn't even we didn't ask. We hadn't done this before. They they all went around and just started giving us candy. Because they're like, well, you just took us around, so here we want to give you. And and they they gave us each probably ten pieces. Of their candy, and they didn't. I mean, they probably only had 30 pieces. I mean, they really were generous, you know. Um, and then Josh, every time he gets anything, he shares first with his sisters, um, and then he'll, you know, eat what's left over. And, and we we haven't ever asked him to do that. He just does it. That's a really noble thing. I really look up to that, you know. Um, other things that you've seen that have made you really happy um, in relations in your home. When have people treated each other so well? Please, Samuel, we've got a microphone over this way. Um, oh. I know that, like, um, sometimes if I, like, have a lot of homework or something, I'll, like, try and switch jobs with one of my siblings. And they probably know that if I'm in a tight spot, they could probably exact a lot more from me than than they do rather but usually it's a fair trade so. <laughs> he's talking Rachel said, I think he's talking about me <laughs> I love that I'm sure he is you're very generous you're kind <laughs> forgiving <laughs> thank you for that anyone else brag about kids if here. yeah of course the, the, the more the merrier this is the happy thing sorry Lee I'm gonna brag about Isaac for a second <laughs> I do love you too um, so this young man right here, I'm going to get emotional. He calls him Deer Yonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's his name for him. And he adores the pieces out of Deer Yonder. I've seen him, I've never seen him ever intentionally hurt him or make him feel bad. He does tease him quite often just because he just loves him to absolute pieces. If you could see the kind of teasing that happens between this boy and that, you would just be tickled because it's so, so sweet. And you can just see the love and feel the love oozing out of his older brother for his little brother. And um, 
I've seen him weep over him out of concern. I've just seen so much affection and love that he has for his little brother. And it's just, it's been a blessing in our home because Isaac's the oldest and just to have that, just that care and concern for his um, siblings and he's he's just such a peacemaker and such a, an amazing example to his siblings and I just can't imagine. I came from the opposite situation where I was always in fear of my life or my brother. And so for me to experience that and then to watch him nurture his siblings and I would have given anything to have had an older brother like Isaac. And so I just, I appreciate that so much. And it's brought so much joy into our home because that contention just isn't there that could be there, that I've seen firsthand and experienced and felt firsthand. So. Thank you so much for sharing. That's and not just story. Isaac, they're all that way. But I'm sure Isaac leads the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Anyone else? Please, Leah. Yeah, okay, I'm going to brag about both my brothers. <laughs> So um, this summer I broke my arm. Um, I can't think of that actually. Oh no! <laughs> anyway, but, um, we won't assume that you did it. No. <laughs> so um, I, um, they, my, so we, my parents own the company, and um, we usually go and work there over the summer. So this happened in like the middle of the summer. So I wasn't able to go and um, go and work. And so both of my brothers dedicated one of their or one of their days at the warehouse to me, and they both earned fifty dollars for me that day. Oh. So they both gave me fifty dollars. That was really nice. That's so <laughs> nice. That is so sweet. I love hearing these stories. Thank you so much for sharing, Leah. <laughs> 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 right. break your arm. <laughs> if you want to break your arm, then Rachel can you know no, work for you. <laughs> no. no. Oh, and it was not worth it. Oh, friends, thank you so much. Was there anyone else who had wanted to share? I want to cut you off if you did. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to say, you know, I think that sometimes contrast can be a very, very powerful teacher. As we think about all the, the really sad, hard things that happened in 1675 and 1676 here in New England, um, and then contrast them with the life that God wants his children to live. Um, really, think about how different running around in the woods and trying to kill each other is from what you just heard about these sweet families here. You know, that, that's a really important difference to note. Um, because I don't know about you, but I noticed a difference in the way that I felt considering, you know, President Hinckley with, you know, the brutal, the tragic overlay and all these really serious, you know, heavy things uh, versus these really sweet acts of sacrifice and service and love. And anyway, I hope you, you felt that too. Uh, I just want to end by saying, you know, um, I'm sure every family could think of some wonderful things that we do for each other from time to time, hopefully all the time, but at least from time to time. Um, and I just wanted to just share just a, just a little story that really warmed my heart over the, the past year. Um, as, as I think you, you all know, um, when my little daughter had cancer, uh, certainly that was a challenge for our family, and we tried to deal with that the best um, that we could, and uh, Heavenly Father was just so good to us. Um, from the very start, um, we had family home meetings about, okay, you know, what does this mean and, and what could happen and let's talk about the spirit world and let's talk about healing and let's talk about the Lord's will and, and just, you know, our, our mission on the earth and it will be as long as it needs to be for each one of us. I mean, just that kind of a thing. And anyway, but uh, we had a family home meeting one night we were talking about that, that uh, topic. Um, and at the end, our little daughter, Acadia, asked if she could say the prayer. And this was in March, the beginning of March. Um, and we said, oh, wonderful things. Love, you know, love to have you say the prayer. And as she prayed that night, um, she prayed, um, you know, and all the normal things. You know, I'm grateful for my blanket, and, you know, and grateful that we have a house, and, you know, thankful for Jesus, and all these nice things. Um, and then she said, and please bless little Hope that she will not have cancer anymore by her birthday. And that, for some reason, I mean, nobody had mentioned anything about a, a birthday or, I mean, anyway, that was what she and her little heart wanted to pray for, like, from the very beginning. Um, and so over the months, over the almost six months, 
um, that Hope had this cancer, um, Acadia prayed. Every time I heard her pray, she would pray that Hope would not have cancer by her birthday. And I just thought that this was such a sweet thing. Um, well, it was really interesting because Hope's final surgery was July 7th. And everything was removed, and doctors let us know that the cancer had been defeated and hopefully won't come back, and it hasn't come back. Um, but I just want to testify to you that July 7th is the day before Hope's birthday. And the whole time, the whole time, Acadia had prayed and prayed and prayed with so much faith that her sister would be cancer-free by her birthday. And I just want to share that I have felt not just the love that Acadia has for her sister, but also the love of a tender Heavenly Father who, who hears the faithful prayers of his little ones and according to his will um, can make miracles. And I'm just so, so grateful um, that we have this kind of love within families um, and from our Heavenly Father who, as a father, shows us what it should be like to live together, um, how we should treat each other. Um, you know, not we, we should be so busy doing things like the things that you just described in families that we don't have time for war. I mean, this should be the, the farthest thing uh, from any endeavor um, that any human ever follows, you know, in, in this world. Um, but yet we have wars going on all the time. And I just wish and, and, and pray and just I think so much about the fact that if we could simply have happy homes based on the principles of the gospel, and if we had always had them, we wouldn't have this unit. Um, but yet we do have the natural man. We do live in a fallen world. We see people make choices like this all the time, and we do need to know how to deal with them. I testify one of the very best ways to teach and learn about war is to learn about what we should be doing instead so that that is our goal, not the last resort of fighting a war, even if it's righteous. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Rachel, would you offer our closing prayer, please? Our dear Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee that we could come together today and learn about um, war and the things that we can do instead of war. And please bless us as we strive to strengthen our own families. And we thank thee for the spirit that has been here today. And in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. All right, friends, we'll take a break and we'll come back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good prayer. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for sharing. I love hearing about your families. You're so welcome.